to how it, did, it was used in the West as a tool, not necessarily as an authentic concept of fear, but also as a tool to promote other ideas and other agendas for Western leaders, particularly the right-wing leaders. And also I'm excited about what I call the Islamophobia from within. How within our local communities, we also support and generate and celebrate Islamophobia. I remember in the beginning of the Arab Spring, all the Arab dictators, without a single exception, they, starting from Ben Ali all the way to Bashar al-Assad, they were talking about, we are fighting Islamic terrorists. And they were delivering this message, talking about the people in the different public space in their cities, rejecting their dictatorships. So, we need to see, we need to see this phenomena, as I said, from the three kind of perspectives the perspective of the phenomena and also how it's sort of promoted within the West and also how it's locally consumed and constructed. I'm also excited about why Islam, this very peaceful religion, was associated with this phenomena, although we know from historical references, from the philosophy of the religion, from the Quran and the Hadith, that the whole notion of multiculturalism is one of the backbones of our religion. So why is it also associated with uh, Islamophobia? But I do respect the other voices. As I said, there are a lot of excellent, fair voices in the West telling us we fully appreciate that Islamophobia is a sort of uh, a phenomenon that was made for particular purposes. And you see here, beautiful, beautiful literature suggest talking about the industry of Islamophobia and how, and how making Muslims the enemies and so on and so forth. All of these kind of theoretical thoughts pushed me to think about the notion of the mosque and how the mosque can be designed and constructed within a Western community. And because of Islamophobia, there's a trend all over the world now that we don't want mosques anymore. No more mosques. So how, this is again a very interesting question. How the most liberal communities in the West came to the conclusion that we don't need a spiritual place? This is also a very interesting question. This is happening in America. Acceleration in terms of resistance and rejection. It's also a phenomenon that I'm, I'm suggesting that this phenomenon is uh, triggered per, particularly in, in the West, and it's, it's against what I call it the physical representation of Islam. So we are rejecting Islam, and I'm talking about the value of the West now, or the, the, the perspective of the West. We reject the Islam, and then we reject the physical representation of Islam. And you have this scattered all over the world. In, most of Europe, in America, it's becoming a very solid movement celebrated even by politicians and the media and so on and so forth. One interesting way to look at this phenomena of either Islamophobia or Moscophobia is to say that this is a conspiracy against us. And I hate this. I hate to interpret everything as a Western conspiracy, right? I like to dig deep and to see, do we have any shortcomings? Are we lazy in tackling some issues that resulted in this world position? I think the very first wave of Moscophobia was related to a very interesting Islamic center that uh, some NGOs in New York decided to have it kind of close to the World Trade Center, kind of close, not even within the proximity of the project after 9-11. But there was absolutely incredible rejection for the project. And not only rejection in terms of, although the project was so, so modern in speaking to the context, but it was again the very first wave of, we don't want Islamic physical representation in the fabric of our cities. And even they made a lot of fun about this. 
This will be sh the shape of the project, and the project will be a sort of a tool to direct more planes to come and hit our skyscrapers. So this is, again, the culture of fear, the culture of hate that was generated. I think I would share with you that we are, as Muslim communities and Muslim thinkers and intellectuals, we are in a very defining moment. If we had this level of fear and hate toward us, what would be our position? I think we are in a challenging time, and I think the image of Islam, particularly from a peaceful perspective, is in a, in a very shattered kind of, uh, of status. Although, again, when we look at history, Muslim communities had this wonderful balance between different faith and the diversity of geography, politics, culture, economics, and so on and so forth. I mean, Islam is about diversity. And also, Islam is about creativity, and about art, and about beauty. And when we talk about beauty in Islam, and this is the beauty of Islam, that when Islam tackled the issue of it was not only about the formal beauty, it was not only about what we can see, but also how, what we can feel, right? And therefore, the holistic understanding of beauty in Islam is related to what I called it here, the visible beauty, but also it's related to the inner beauty, the beauty of the soul and the beauty of the mind. And the, per the perfect, the holistic beauty is the sum of the two kind of beauties. So the concept of creativity in Islam is very well rooted. And a lot of philosophers, talkers, scholars, they discussed very much the idea of beauty and creativity, and that creativity is a sort of responsibility for Muslims. You have to be creative because you are Muslim, to that extent. And that was manifested all over the world. We saw how the Islam, when they moved from a country to a country, from a city to a city, from a culture to a culture, they were able to use this unlimited level of creativity to come up with radically different solutions in different contexts. And suddenly, we have what I call the creativity crisis. We decided to froze our time. We decided to select a specific time in our history and to say, this is a representation of Islam. This is a representation of our identity. And whenever we talk about Islam, we have to recycle this again and again and again and again. But I think being traditional does not mean being outdated. Historically Islamic art, and when I say art here, I mean it in a very comprehensive way, art, architecture, urbanism, calligraphy, painting, and so on and so forth, was so much into innovation. But this is what we do now. This is what Muslim architects are doing in their own cities. And when you start to argue with them, they would say that this is Islamic architecture. This is inspired by Islam. And then we went to the West. And we are building in a different culture, but we didn't learn from history. And we kept on imposing our own styles. Styles in buildings and spaces that would reject integration, that would emphasize segregation, as opposed to delivering a comprehensive message about Islam that this is a religion of tolerance and acceptance. So these are mosques and, his, and, and Islamic centers in Rome, London, and so on and so forth. And then we wonder why people hate our mosques. Why they reject our mosques. I think what was absolutely wonderful in my research that I was able to see great examples not only in the West, but here in our region. A lot of architects and urban designers started to question the whole notion of the mosque. Here, a wonderful example where you will see or you will reinterpret the mosque as a public space. It's, it's basically a place for people to get together. Or, 
emphasizing the spiritual experience. This is very, very important again and again, the word experience. How you feel when you are in a mosque. How the spatial quality of the mosque is inviting you to reflect and contemplate. We saw the example of, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, College of Islamic Studies a lot in, in this conference. But I am showing this for you here from a radically different perspective. This is my office here. I have an office here as a professor. And when you are in this building, the least thing that you will feel is that you are in a mosque. Because this is a place that a true contemporary representation of the movement from madrasa to a college. So you have students, you have library, you have coffee shops, you have people getting together, you have parties, you have everything, you have life. Basically you have life. And I think this is exactly the role of the mosque that we missed it. We transformed the mosque into a place to perform rituals as opposed to a place representing and inspiring our life. Again, the notion of the uh, going out a bit of, of the uh, uh, Middle East and the Gulf, in Singapore, the, 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 how the geometry is, uh, is, is, is uh, emphasizing the spiritual experience. And then you go to Europe. Amazing example. Transparency. Why we have to have solid borders between the mosque and the community in the West? On the country, drop the borders, penetrate the mosque, allow people to penetrate the mosque visually and physically, even if they are non Muslims. But this is the whole beauty of the mosque because it's the, mosque, the house of God, it's Ubayt Allah. And therefore, you allow people walking to see that those people are peaceful. They are praying. They are reciting Quran. They are talking. They are eating. They are having a wonderful time. They are not doing a plot to do a destruction of a tower or to, to do something wrong regarding our country and our interest and so on and so forth. Again, another very interesting example in, in Albania, Plaza in the mosque. That was a wonderful pattern in the anatomy of traditional Muslim societies, cities. But then you have a more contemporary relevant interpretation. The, the walls of the surrounding buildings will act as a sort of the enclosure of this space. And then you have a plaza that you within this plaza, you can pour, perform the prayer, and then you can use it also as a public space for people to get together and have a good time. Not, again, not necessarily Muslims, everybody, community members. Beautiful, beautiful space. And again, sacred and emphasizing spiritual experience without literally enclosing people in an enclosed space. Full of life. Even birds are having a wonderful time. <laughs> again, the issue of geometry and the beauty of geometry and how the architects, as I said, they are not looking at specific time frame in the history of Islamic civilization and art, but they put this responsibility on the shoulders that we are creative people and we are true Muslims and therefore we have to activate our minds and our creativity. The example in Turkey also is absolutely beautiful because the act of prayer will be a sort of a byproduct from enjoying the nature. And I would claim that even interacting with nature can be more spiritual than a lot of mosques that we see around the place. Yeah. True. So, what we can do about this if we are really excited about the different kind of mosque in the future? I would claim that we have to transform the mosque into a vibrant place, not a deserted space. This is our philosophy now, that we transform every single mosque into a place for performing rituals. And by the way, if you have any economical background, by cost and benefit analysis, the mosque is the most non-feasible building on earth. 
because we use the mosque only for a total of an hour, an hour and a half for the whole day, believe it or not. Most of our mosques in the Arab world, we open it only for prayer. Correct me if I'm wrong. We perform prayer and then we close the door. This is not a mosque. This is not Jannah. This is not Bait Allah. This is a place to perform rituals. So I want to go beyond this and preach for a more vibrant place. And to have it a vibrant place, I'm suggesting three main points. Number one, creativity. But not only creativity from <coughs> architectural and formalistic and structural point of view, but also creativity in functions and activities. Why we cannot eat in the mosque? Why we cannot have coffee in the mosque? Why we cannot have a terrace from the mosque overlooking the view? Why not? Why we don't have a children park in the mosque? Why don't we have a family gathering in the mosque, and so on and so forth? This is the kind of creativity that I'm excited about. How to push the, the mosque, the program of the mosque, outside of the boundary of just the place for rituals. Number two, claim your mosque. Let's bring the mosque back to its role as the center of our life. The cultural center, the political center, the spiritual center, the creational center, and so on and so forth. This is, in my own opinion, very important for the future of the mosque. And then transform it from a ritual place to my place, sense of belonging. Again, I'm asking you to correct me if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but we don't have belonging to our mosque anymore. I saw my colleagues driving their cars, stopping in, the in front of the mosque until iqamat al-salah, and then they will go and do salah and leave because this is the only sense of belonging that they have. So, as a conclusion, I think particularly when it comes to mosques in the West, I would suggest that we used to do mosques in the West, and this is why we are imposing mosques in the West. I think what we should do is Western mosques. Mosques that speak to the country, speak to the culture, speak to the people. We can do that, but again, focusing on a place for the community, spatial experience and spatial geometry that would help to transform the place into a sacred place, deep spiritual experience, openness and transparency, and creating a sense of belonging. And the final slide before I thank you all. I had a walk in Dubai walk, and by the end, city walk, inside. And by the end of the city walk, I saw a cube. And I walked by the cube, and I found a door, a glass door. And from the glass door, I was, say, I was able to see people performing, praying, and reciting Quran. And I didn't realize that that was a mosque. And because of that, I was invited to go and to pray. And ironically, they don't have a minute, and they don't have a dome, but I had a wonderful time in the mosque. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.